welcome back to Gripping Reality. It's good to be with you. Sorry we've been uh, kind of gone for a while, that we've been a little bit busy uh, on life and trying to deal with lots of fun things. Uh, of course, tomorrow. if people are binging on Gripping Reality, who cares how long it's been since our last one? They went from 48 to this one, number 49, straight on, no break in time. It's one of those uh, uh, time travel things. That's true. Yeah, so, so nobody tomorrow, cares. But tomorrow is an important day because we are launching, actually launching, drum roll, experiencing revelation. Egg roll uh, or drum roll? Drum roll. Drum roll, not egg roll. Got it. We started <laughs> getting ready to launch this book back in February because of layout issues and ah, blah, blah, blah. You don't want to hear all that stuff. But it exactly. ended up being... May 17, 18, 19. So if you're seeing this podcast after the 19th, the book is still for sale. We're just doing a light diffuse and get this thing off the pad right. for right. May 17, 18, 19. Really trying to right. get it launched with a lot of sales and so on and so forth. All that we, re stuff. we reduced the price of the book. We reduced the price of the ebook was down to $3.99, uh, which just about anybody anywhere can afford. You can read it on any technology. You don't have to have Kindle. You can buy, buy from right. KDP. And we also have a recording of the main part of the book, which is a dramatic script on right. Revelation, uh, explaining the base, experiencing the basic concept right. that we're presenting in this book. Right. So we just want to encourage you to go ahead and get it. But but today the podcast really is not about that. We thought that'd be kind of fun, at least I did, for us to maybe fill in the blanks a little bit more for you. Mike is the writer of the book. And uh, so the really question, the question in my mind is that, so Mike, why why did you decide to write a fifth interpretation of the book of Revelation? You know, the, the, I actually have been asked that question a lot. Uh, why put this out there? I mean, why not just keep your mouth shut? You're 68 years old. Why don't you just retire and go golf? And and that's a legitimate that's a legitimate question. Uh, since I was in junior high or high school, every project that I put myself to, I created a document of some kind. I wrote it into a book. Most of the stuff I've written didn't I didn't do it for sale. I didn't I didn't do it for that reason. But my brain works really well when I'm forced to put something down in sentences that make sense to someone else. It's an idea in my head, but I want to be able to communicate idea A so that another person can also have idea A. And that's just part of being wired as a teacher, as a trainer, as somebody who influences others. I mean, that, that's just where it comes from. So I've, I've done 27 books. And over the last 20 years, it really has kind of congealed out of a vague fog into a crystal clear idea. The book of Revelation, closing the New Testament, was not intended by God to be scary, frightening, dark about judgment, about the prominence of evil in this world, end times. I just did not think that that's what should close the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And and that's a struggle because all the all the four interpretations, allegory, preterist, historical and end times or futuristic, all of them center on this battle between good and evil, right. the right. force of darkness, the role of the dragon, the beast, right. the mark of the beast. And whether you say that's about ancient Jerusalem or you say it's about the end of the world, the whole concept is nerve wracking, produces anxiety in, in a huge number of people. This morning, I was talking with a very dear friend of mine, a guy who's been a Christian for decades and decades, involved in the church, really biblically astute. He's aware, he's thoughtful. And we were talking about his pastor of his church uh, getting ready to do a new series and said to my friend, what do you think if I did a series on the book of Revelation? And, and my friend isn't promoting my book. He just said, so what would you, what, what's your view on that? And he had another book that he had bought somewhere. 
that kind of has a different flavor of one of the major interpretations. And he was going to kind of go with that. So I'm actually talking to my friend. And I said, when I woke up about 20 years ago in the middle of the night, I read straight through the book of Revelation from verse one to chapter 22, verse 21, 404 verses. I didn't stop at the chapter breaks. I didn't stop at the silos. I didn't look at each individual letter and figure out why is Jesus going to spew me out of his mouth. I didn't look at that stuff. I read the whole thing all the way through. And I did that over and over and over. And eventually the concept of the book as a whole began to emerge. I'm watching a play. This is how John is communicating Jesus. So I'm talking to my friend this very morning. It really came out of reading the book of Revelation over and over and over straight through. And my friend said, you know, I'm ashamed to say I've actually never done that. I said, what? He goes, I've never read all the way through the book of Revelation. I've read all of it. But I read some and I put it down and I pick it up and I do devotions and I'll I'll read another chapter and I put it down. Right. I'm going to read one chapter a day. So I, you know, I read the chapter 13 and then I read chapter 14. You never just read through the whole thing all the way through. I mean, that's how John wrote it. It was written to right. be read, all, to be experienced all the way through. And so when you break it up into puzzle pieces and look at each puzzle piece, of course, it's going to seem very frightening. And you see a beautiful picture, Jesus being worshipped, the handles Messiah. I mean, that's just wonderful stuff. But then right. you pick up darkness and blood and lightning strikes and earthquakes. And those are the pictures that say, wow, the book of Revelation is really scary. So it was amazing to me. Just today, a very good friend who I have immense respect for his biblical knowledge said, you know, I've never read all the way through it. I don't really know what the big picture is. So as I work through this com- this uh, concept, ultimately the idea is why put it out there? I've got a viewpoint, so what, who cares? But I'm c- right. the kind of person that over my entire lifetime now, <laughs> I have been wired to write into books and to teach what I think that I've learned. Now, the pushback is, I got questions about that. I have a different viewpoint about that. I'm not sure I understand what you mean about that. And that dialogue cannot take place without having this be out in the public realm. Right, right. So it really so, comes from that. So as you were reading through and reading through and reading through, was there any like one trigger or a ha scene or something that really was the point where you went, you saw a play that you had not seen it. And then you went, that's yeah. it. That's there, the that, there really is. There is one split second. It, and I read over it, it, again and again and again. I would wake up in the middle of the night, like most people do. You wake up completely wide awake at three o'clock in the morning. It's like, what am I going to do? Well, you just lay there and toss and turn. You turn on the TV. You get up and go to the bathroom and walk around the house for a while, maybe sit down and read until you're tired and go back to bed. So I have those nights like everybody else does. And and I got up and I have a reading table and I read through the book of Revelation and then I did it again and again, not day after day after day. It was months apart over a five year period and different versions of the Bible, King James, NIV. New English Translation, Jerusalem Bible. I read them all. Good News for Modern Man, Living Bible. I read everything I could get my hands on. I didn't have any kind of a huge breakthrough insight about this. I'm just seeing all the pictures. My brain, most people think of dyslexia as a disability. Dyslexia is seeing things without necessarily having words attached to it and being able to break any letter or words and move the parts around in a person's brain just kind of randomly. So that's the way my brain works. So as I'm reading, I'm creating these little pictures in my mind that are like a film with separate, separate scenes or, or images. And I had about 10,000 of those through the book of revelation, every word, phrase, the color, I had all that in my mind. 
And one night, I ha- I didn't journal this, so I really have no idea when it was, but it was after five years or so of doing this. I have all these pictures in my mind, all these different versions, all the way the words are, I read it in Greek. I mean, I'm, I'm doing all that stuff. It's all in my brain somewhere. And I was reading chapter seven, where verses 13 through 17, this is the moment. This is the aha moment. John is writing the whole book in first person. I did this. I was standing here. Behind me was this. I heard a voice. Everything's done in first person. And and in chapter seven, the 24 elders and the four living creatures who repeatedly come into the book to worship around the throne of God and to celebrate God Almighty and the lamb that was slain. They That's what they do. They worship over and over and over. John writes in chapter seven, one of the 24 elders turned to me and said, do you know who these in white robes are, white stoles? Do you know who they are and where they've come from? And I said to him, no, sir, I don't know. You know. And he said, these are the ones who went through the tribulation. They washed their robes in the blood. And he gives an explanation. That moment. I could see the elder on a stage turn to John, who's the narrator, and go, hey, hey, buddy, do you know who these are that just came on stage? And John's there going, hey, I'm the narrator. I'm not in this play. I'm narrating the story. Don't bother me. And And the elder goes, no, no, really. Do you know who these are? And it's really a statement to the entire congregation watching or the audience or the people reading the book do you know who these are and john speaks for all of us i have no idea who they are i'm narrating a story you're in the story you would know and he says yes these are the ones that went through the tribulation and that's not bad for them God's taking care of them. There's no more tears. The sun doesn't beat on their head. They're going to have food enough to eat. And then he gives explanation. So as I'm reading this, I see they're on a Greco-Roman stage, a first century stage, and the elder turns to the narrator and says, do you know who these are? And the whole audience goes immediately quiet because we're going to get some inside information that we... This is an aside. So I saw that split second, and then my mind went into hyperdrive. In chapter one, John is speaking, making these grand statements, and all of a sudden he says, and I heard a voice behind me. What? What does it mean behind me? And I turned to see who it was, and Jesus comes, makes an appearance with this huge Greco-Roman costume on, huge head, hair white as wool, sword coming out of his mouth, slash across his, sash across his chest, feet like burning, all the costume. And John runs over to his feet. Where's he running? What, What does this mean? He runs over, falls at his feet. Jesus puts his hand on him and says, don't be afraid. I'm the beginning and I'm the end introduces the play right it's all happening in a few seconds then in chapter 19 john in the middle of this praise and glorious worship of the lamb that is now risen from the dead he runs over to the other narrator at the the 24 elders and the and the four living creatures are all worshiping everybody's super excited all these words going on john runs over to the other narrator falls at his feet And that narrator, that angel says, whoa, don't do that. Worship God. That's the theme of this book. Worship God. Right. And and John, so he picks himself up, goes back to his side of the stage. And then and the the celebration goes on. And chapter 22. John does the same thing. He runs over to the other narrator, the other angel falls at his feet that the other narrator says or the angel says, yikes, don't do that. Worship God only. I'm a fellow servant with you. I thought, wait a minute. 
John's the apostle. He knows how to worship at the feet of Jesus. And all of a sudden he's running over to this other guy and falling at his feet to worship. And that and that guy goes, whoa, don't do that. Worship God. That's hilarious. I couldn't find a commentary that would explain not only why does John do it once, but why does he do it twice? So this is all happening in a few seconds when the elder turned and said, hey, buddy, do you know who these are? That moment burst into my mind all the pictures, all 10,000 pictures. We're watching, we're experiencing the story of Jesus right. on a massive theater in Ephesus or in Pergamum or in Thyatira and Laodicea. In those cities, the people who went to theater were the elite people. They were the top shelf folks. They were the official citizens of the cities. And John is trying to present Jesus in their world. But it was that moment that the, the, it all made sense. And then it took me probably 10 years of study and analysis and back and forth in my own mind, talking to many other people, preliminary teaching, pushback, adjustment, all that took place. And eventually, two years writing this actual book and getting it ready, that's really where it came from. But that moment, still when I read <clears throat> chapter 7, mm -hmm. verses 13 through 17, the elder turned to me and says, do you know who these are? And I say, I have no idea. You know, that moment to me was the absolute burst. This is a dramatic presentation of Jesus, not darkness, not death. Not the dragon, not the beast, not the mark of the beast, not Armageddon, none of that stuff. It is about Jesus Christ and to present Jesus Christ to people who loved theater. Right. That's right. that's my view of this. So thematically, that's where you would say this is where it stays, stands, is that, that John, is this correct, that John is producing this so that they might see who Jesus truly is. So, so hopefully, and then the que the another question, I'm not going to put in your mouth, but I will, no, is well, did it ever become a play done in theater? We have no way of knowing. We have no way of knowing, except we don't have copies of scripts. Children learned how to write Greek by writing the scripts of great plays. The church in Greek took the words of Jesus in Aramaic, uh, challenging the Pharisees and Sadducees by calling them hypocrites. That's not the word Jesus used, but that's the word in Greek. Hupokrates is the word for a stage actor, right. someone under a mask. And the right. idea of taking the story of Jesus and giving it to hypocrites, I think the people younger than John said, you know, ain't no way we're doing that. Right. We don't know what this book means, but there's no way we're going to the right. leaders of the theater in Ephesus and saying, hey, our apostle wrote a story that might be really good on stage. Would you guys consider putting this book into life? On I think that never happened. But John wrote it in such a way that any first century person who went to theater loved the theater, understood apocalyptic genre, that they would read it and say, oh, I see Jesus, his birth, his death, his resurrection. I see that in this storyline. And I think that's what he did. So the reason we're doing this today, and Mike and I, I actually said, let's, let's talk about this. And you're probably saying, well, what's your role in this whole thing? Mike wrote the book and all that. And it's like, yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, but how Mike and I have worked together for almost 36 years, uh, we've worked on tons of projects and materials together and presentations. Um, he and I do a lot of team collaborating. I do a lot of editing uh, for, you know, together. And he asked me to come in and be a part of it, which has been a real honor, and we've been working together on several projects over the last several years. And but the whole idea here was that I also believe that I could not understand how Revelation 
was depicted in such a way that was all about judgment, death, dying, destruction. Not that I don't believe there is, you know, judgment. Is it going to be judgment? Of course, I, I believe in that. But the reality was, is where's the hope of glory that really I knew in all of the New Testament, and now we're going to have this one outlier that is this horrendous thing. Uh, it just never made sense to me. So when Mike started writing the book and started sharing the ideas about this thing, to which he and I have spent hundreds of hours uh, having dialogue about this material, um, it started to make real sense for me. And we both have commented many times when you ask people, you know, uh, what do you think of the book of Revelation? They almost recoil. It's like, I don't understand. It's really confusing. I don't like it. It's icky, ugh, you know. So that just didn't make sense to us. So that's how we ended here because we're not here to, we're here to help people hopefully discover who Jesus is. That's the whole intent of what we're doing. This is not about money. This is not about making a name for ourselves or any of those kinds of things. It's about the story of Jesus. And we want people to come in contact with him. And maybe some people who have said, you know, I'm just done with all this stuff. I've been to church and I'm done with church. And we're going, why don't you take another look? And see if maybe there's something here that's a little different for you. So, Michael, any last thoughts? So that's a, that really is the challenge. And there's going to raise a lot of questions, uh, a lot of issues to be examined more carefully. Putting this idea out there doesn't mean that everybody who considers this book or reads it is going to automatically believe my viewpoint. I understand that. If it doesn't get out into the public discussion, it really is worthless. It's just a pet idea and, and sure. it goes nowhere. But I think by putting this out there, uh, we really have the chance of having some extremely helpful and, and insightful dialogue. So for those who buy the book early, we are not giving tickets. We're not going to regulate this. But if you buy the book early, this launch time, 17, 18, 19 of May, uh, or any time in the next week or so, we're going to do our first Facebook Live podcast on Monday, June 6th at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific Time, and then the relative uh, time zones in between. You'll be able to click on the Facebook Live. You're driving home. You can just click in on your phone, listen to the discussion dialogue. We guarantee that we will take and deal with the first 10 legitimate questions that come in to Mike at Gripping Reality, spell that with a Y, M-Y-K-E, or M-I-K-E, gets to the two of us, at grippingreality.com. Send your question, get the book, develop a legitimate inquiry or an investigation uh, that will help us have a greater dialogue about this concept. If you're writing a snarky question or something just to create havoc, we're not going to deal with that stuff. But if you have a legitimate question about what's going on to really get deeper and dig into this, we will take those questions. Now, eventually, we may be doing podcasts that have a live audience and you can actually ask real live questions in real time and respond to what other people are saying. We're going to see how that goes. But we're doing this free. There's no charge. We might have four people that sign up for this or, or engage it, and we might have 400. I mean, we have no idea what's going to happen. Right. But get the book. We reduce the price down to really bare bones. And uh, you can do an ebook. You can do a print on demand. You can do just listen to the theatrical production uh, on yep. any of the audiobook uh, uh, platforms, platforms and then develop some questions. Send your question in. And if we're on Facebook Live, we may be able to take live questions right from the floor, but we're going to see how that goes. We're, what we're interested in is a lively, meaningful, uh, well-thought-out dialogue, not a, not a presentation one way, right. but right. really a digging into Revelation as to what it's supposed to mean and how do we understand it. That's really what we're presenting. So thanks for being with us today, and enjoy reading, enjoy listening. Uh, when you get the, the, the uh, Reader's Theater and the book, 
and we will have some great discussion on June 6th. So have a great day. Thanks.